Uh, for those of you that may be surprised to see me up here and not know who I am, uh, Pastor Luke Helmuth, Calvary Chapel Hutchinson. It's an honor to be with you today and to be here. Um, a number of you I know, as I've talked with you um, throughout the morning, um, have told me that you are praying for my wife, Victoria, for us. Um, she was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer uh, back in September, <clears throat> August, September of last year. And despite that diagnosis, it has been an absolutely um, incredible journey uh, with the Lord, and we have seen Him do some incredible and mighty things. You know, it's always a challenge when you're filling in for someone, <coughs> especially, um, you know, in a Calvary Chapel or in a, in a place where they teach um, expositionally, word by word, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. You know, I know that Patrick's been in uh, Romans on Sunday mornings. He's been in Isaiah on the midweek study. Um, and so, you know, as I just sought the Holy Spirit, where, where do we need to be? Came back to just the simplicity, maybe, of what we already know, but where we need to be in terms of being reminded of just some of the simplicity of where it's at in our walk with the Lord, in our relationship with Him. I'm going to be in Galatians 5, <clears throat> and since I don't have the, um, I do have a slideshow or PowerPoint, if you guys want to put that up. Um, since I don't have the benefit of, of laying the groundwork um, by teaching through the preceding chapters, I'm not even going to take time to, to read all those um, today. Let's just remind ourselves a little bit about the book of Galatians. The uh, first two chapters have Paul's uh, defense of and the authentication of his apostleship. And in chapter 3, Paul begins with a bunch of questions that sort of lay the groundwork for the final chapters. Um, might want to turn back a, a page to chapter 3. We're going to read a few verses there at the beginning, he says, you foolish Galatians, he has some pretty strong words, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? In other words, how did you come about receiving the Holy Spirit? What he doesn't say there is, you've been holding on to the law so tightly, so tenaciously. You, you become legalistic. But when you were saved, were you saved by the law and the Holy Spirit came in? Or were you saved... By grace, through faith, and the Holy Spirit came in. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit or by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does He who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, do it by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Is it, see, that's the question. Where does the law come in at? What is its place? What is its importance? In other words, where did you go wrong after you've been saved for a while? Why did you turn back to the ways that you came from? And then in the, remind, in the remainder of chapter 3 and also 4, he takes us through the doctrinal aspects of justification by faith. <clears throat> and in chapter 5, we sort of get to the the fun part, the practical application of the letter to the Galatians, kind of like the dessert that comes after the meal, the, the flavorful part. We recognize that Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ. We've heard his testimony. We know that the law can never be a means to salvation. It, it shows us our sin, but it can't be a means to salvation. And we know that there's nothing that we can do 
to earn the grace that God extended to us at Christ's expense. And now, through the mouth and the pen of the Holy Spirit, God speaks through Paul to give us the tools to live by in the freedom that we've received through the Holy Spirit. It's at salvation that the Holy Spirit comes to live within us. The reason for living by grace through faith is freedom. Not freedom to do as we please in any way, but freedom as, well, let's look at it. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. You see, at salvation, grace gives us the freedom from the penalty of sin. Living by the Spirit frees us from the power of sin, and eternity provides us freedom from the presence of sin. See, see that's, that's in a nutshell the freedom that salvation brings to us, then and then. Therefore, because it was for freedom that Christ set us free, what's it there for? What was the reason? Keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Paul's challenge here is not to return to your former ways. In other words, keep growing up. Don't let your growth be stunted. Keep maturing. Don't regress. Don't fall behind in that grace relationship. Don't re-enslave yourself. Don't be a repeat offender in the flesh. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again that to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You see, Paul's point is if you're going to insist on keeping the law in one aspect as it brings salvation, then you have to keep the entirety of the law, all 617 commandments of it, in order to keep the law perfectly to achieve salvation if you believe that salvation comes through the law and by works, which it doesn't. You've been severed from Christ. You see, it, it, it's taken you away from your relationship with Jesus, with Messiah. You who are seeking to be justified by the law, you've fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. It's impossible to keep the law in its entirety. Praise God for grace. If the way to salvation and living a life of faith in the Spirit is not found in the law, well, then how is it found? Verse 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. See, the supreme indication of a relationship that is in Christ, that is in Jesus, is the evidence of love working hand in hand with faith. That's the agape love. You're probably familiar with the different forms of love in the Greek language, but agape is simply the, the love that exhibits the character and nature of God himself. It's a God love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? I, I like the way the NIV puts it. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? Who tripped you up? Who caused you to stumble? Who got in your way? See, these Judaizers were trying to enforce their view of the law. And Paul said, no, no. This persuasion, where did it come from? Did not come from him who calls you. <clears throat> A little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. I have confidence in you and the Lord that you will adopt no other, other view, but the one who is disturbing you will bear his judgment, whoever he is. But I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I persecuted? then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. I, I wish those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves. Those are strong words that Paul has for those who are misleading, who are distracting, who are steering away from the truth of the gospel message. 
So the question for us then is, so why are we here? Sometimes it's put this way, what's the meaning of life? Theologians, philosophers, the intelligentsia have over the centuries tried to explain that. Well, Paul does it pretty well. (laughs) You ever wondered why you're here? You ever wondered why God placed you here for this time and this season of your life and His kingdom? You ever wonder why He wants a relationship with you? I mean, we, we're these frail, finite, fleshly people, yet the God of the universe wants a relationship with me? I mean, that's, that's pretty incredible. That's pretty incredible. Why does he place the people in our path or the situations that we face and and come up against? Why does he place the people there? Why do those things happen? Good questions. For you were called to freedom. There's the answer. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. See, there's there's that agape word again. You see, Paul's saying, you've got the freedom that you received when you were born again, but don't use that for the flesh to make itself known, but rather in love, in agape, serve one another. Focus on the freedom that grace gives us to love. That's not out of obligation. It's not out of legalism. Not as a chance for the flesh to fulfill its desires. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Don't you love that? I love that. Because here he's talking about the law and how the law doesn't save anyone. He's talking about how it distracts and takes away from, and yet what, what does Paul do? He masterfully reaches back into the tenets of the law, of the Hebrew scriptures of the Torah, and he brings it forward and he uses it to support his own argument. He says that the law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbors yourself. Now, that's more than one word, isn't it? See, the intent of the law is captured in that single word of love. Specifically, the the Jesus-style, unconditional love of agape. Our flesh, you're in my flesh, is the default setting, right? I, I mean, if we're going to just default to pleasing something or someone, guess who it's gonna be? Me right? If you've raised kids, you you don't have to teach them to do wrong, right? You got to train them to do right. The flesh is the default. The application for us then is to agape others, to love them with God's characteristic love in the same way that we love ourselves or satisfy ourselves. How different would the world be? How different would the church be? How different would my family be, my work be, my home be? How different would that be if everything I did was done in love in the same way that I want to satisfy my fleshly desires and would satisfy that requirement for love? Things would be pretty different. And again, we're talking agape. Here's the thing I've discovered about the law. The law can serve as a weight. It can serve as an anchor. It can can serve as a shackle. It can hold us down and tie us down and, and keep us from going places. The law is weighty. And you see, the more we focus on the law, the law, the law, the law, and the the don't, 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 guess what that becomes? Becomes our focus. 
Our focus becomes on not doing certain things, right? But how about if we focused on the do's? Because if we focus on loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, guess what? Not loving my neighbor in certain ways suddenly disappears. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you find that the rigidity of the law goes away. In loving your neighbor as yourself, you're keeping the law because the elements of the law are fulfilled in that love. But then he issues a warning, verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you're not consumed by one another. See, there are those who would rather bite in word or in deed than they would rather, and they would rather devour. They'd rather consume by the ways that they speak or act in harmful ways other than exhibiting a compassionate and a caring love. Remember the NIV, verse 7? You were running a race, a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? See, Paul's speaking metaphorically there, but there's a direct application to our culture, to our society. I have this version I use occasionally called the LPV. It's the Luke paraphrase version. And the Luke paraphrase version of that verse says, you were doing so well showing agape to others. Who merged into your lane and caused you to take an agape tour on your commute to church today? Maybe that didn't happen. But you see, our response to other people getting in our lane challenges our ability to love them, doesn't it? Not just on the road, but in many other places, within and outside of the body of Christ. So, Paul, how then should we live? Why are we here? Well, Paul says in verse 16, but I say, walk by or follow the Spirit and you'll not carry out the desires of the flesh. See, there are times that in order to exp explain the present or even the future, we need to go back to the beginning. We're all the product of our, of our life experiences, the sum total of our life experiences. And so it's helpful for us to sometimes go back, to just kind of push away all the clutter and go back in simplicity to the beginning. You see, when, when things happen in relationships, sometimes it's very good to go back and say, why did I start this relationship after all? And, and sometimes in my relationship with Jesus, things can get kind of cluttered. They can get muddy. They can get clouded. And it's helpful to just pull back a little bit and say, okay, where, where did this start? When was that fresh and new? What, what was the beauty of that experience when I was first born again? When the Holy Spirit was, was moving in powerful ways and, and I felt that and I lived that and I breathed that and I, that was my life. There are times when we struggle with a decision that it's all often helpful to, to go back and look at what necessitated that decision. Things are kind of crazy here. It's hard to make a decision. Okay, where did I come from in needing to make that decision? What led up to making this decision? When things in life or at home, at work, seem stagnant, like we're not going anywhere, it's valuable to, to ask the question and reevaluate our initial goals. What, what got me started on this? If we go back to Genesis 1, we discover that at creation, when God created everything, the plants, the trees, the birds, the animals, us, He created them for a purpose. It was to bear fruit, specifically kind after kind. 
to bear fruit after their own kind. If we read about the creation of man as he created man in his own image, male and female, it was to be fruitful and multiply. Man, how our culture has distorted that. After the flood, he reinforced that same purpose to Noah, saying twice, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth, <laughs> fill it, multiply in it. So why am I here? It's to multiply. It's to, it's to reproduce. It's to bear fruit. And, and here in this setting, we call that what? We call it discipleship. I'm reproducing followers of Jesus. We're born again, and then we spend our entire lives learning how to live and follow Jesus and reproduce disciples. If God created kind to produce after their own kind, then if you plant tomato seeds, you're going to get tomatoes. Okay, you guys know, just check it. <laughs> lemon seeds? Lemons, yeah. If life gives you lemon seeds, plant them, right? Oak, oak trees come from acorns, okay. You didn't say oak seeds. <laughs> you see, everything produces after its own kind. Springtime, we get those maple seed helicopters, right? This time of year, you got that cotton flying around. So if it's true that kind produces after kind, I think the question we have to ask is, what kind of fruit am I producing? That depends on the type of seed we're planting. If I'm planting the seeds of flesh then I'm going to produce the fruit of the flesh. If I'm living through the power of the Spirit and I'm planting spirit seeds, so to speak, then I'm going to bear fruit in kind, in keeping with that relationship with the Spirit. But it's a battle, isn't it? You see, if you, if you put a tomato plant in the ground, <clears throat> if the conditions are right, it's going to produce tomatoes. But I've never gone out to my garden and put my ear to a tomato plant and heard it struggling to produce, right? No, because if the environment is that way for it to produce, if the nutrition is right for it to produce, it just does what the DNA that God created it to have does. So it's a natural byproduct of being a tomato plant that it produces tomatoes. The same is true for us, but it's a battle. Why? Verse 17, the flesh sets its desires against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. See, the flesh pleases self. Our goal is to please God, not self. So if we're pleasing self, we're bearing self-fruit. If we're pleasing God, then we're bearing God-fruit or spirit-fruit. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. This is the picture of an animal that's led, not driven along. The law drives along. The Spirit leads. There's the freedom. If we're led by the Spirit, we travel willingly ahead, and we're not bogged or weighted down by the weight of the law. I said a little bit ago, the law holds us down, ties us down. It serves as an anchor. It's weighty. When we allow the, the, the law to overburden us, to cut in on us, to weigh us down, we end up not going anywhere. Kind of like this guy. You end up just sort of being, whoops, there, that guy. We end up being suspended, right? We're just, the load of the law ties us down. 
If that same load were on a four-wheeled cart instead of a two-wheeled cart, that donkey could be led along and pull the weight, no problem. But because the, the weight is misproportionately placed and there's only two wheels, he ends up being suspended, not going anywhere. It's a great picture of the law. But the freedom that the Spirit provides really allows us to go places, doesn't it? You see, if we focus on the do's, loving our neighbor, then the don'ts take care of themselves because we have the freedom to move. We're not held back by the law, even when the load is heavy. Being led by the Spirit, the byproduct of which is love, frees us from the restrictions of the law, doesn't it? See, you don't get a speeding ticket for going the speed limit. Now, you can get one for going too slow, as my wife's, I think it was her grandmother, found out. She got a, a ticket for going too slow. It wasn't a speeding ticket. But see, you, you want to avoid speeding tickets? What do you do? Drive the speed limit. That's pretty simple, right? Not always. But you see, sometimes the law has these things that fingers and tenets and teeth that, that we get all concerned about. But if you're, if you're concerned about speeding because you're speeding, guess what? You're going to be watching for where the cops are. Guess what? You're going to be distracted because your full attention isn't going to be on driving. And guess what? You're not going to get there that much faster. Five miles an hour from my house here, it's about 45 minutes, five miles an hour makes a difference of less than four minutes. Is it really worth all the stress, the cost to my body, the danger to other drivers, potentially, the risk of a ticket? Is it really worth that? I think the answer is no. But then let's ask ourselves about relationships, loving others. See, is it worth risking the consequences to a relationship by holding to my personal preferences? I'm not talking convictions here. My personal preferences, am I so convinced that I'm right that I'm willing to hold on to that and win the argument at the risk of losing a brother or sister? Or am I willing to give up my rights for the sake of showing love? You see, we can, we can become so concerned with being right or winning that we really neglect what we're being taught here. And that's to live by the Spirit and live in love. So practically, what does it look like being led by the Spirit? What does it look like to, to be living or walking with the Spirit, to be living in the Spirit, walking with the Spirit? How do we know if we're, if we're producing spirit fruit or flesh fruit? How do we know that? Well, Paul tells us. We need to become fruit inspectors, inspecting the fruit of our lives. And here's the fruit, beginning verse 19, of the flesh. Now, the deeds of the flesh are evident, they're visible, which are immorality. The Greek word there is pornea. I don't think I have to explain what that is. Adultery, immorality within marriage, fornication, immorality outside of marriage homosexual relationships, lesbian relationships, intercourse with animals, immorality, impurity, moral or physical lustfulness, sensuality, unrestrained lust that is shameless and outrageous, idolatry, 
worship of false gods, of anything that replaces or displaces God. You see, I think we can become kind of masterful at saying, well, I'm not an idolater because I haven't replaced God. But what about displacing Him? What about something else crowding in and filling a spot or a space or a time or a place that truly belongs to God? Entertainment is a, is a classic example of that. Sorcery, witchcraft, and its practices, Wiccan, um, the dark uh, magic arts. The word there is pharmakia, mind-altering substances. Enmities, hatred, strife, contention, jealousy, outbursts, outbursts of anger, passionate outrages, disputes, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, factions, heresy, envying, drunkenness, carousing, reveling, riotous. And I love it. <clears throat> Paul says, just in case you're thinking of saying, those don't apply to me, he, he, puts, a, he puts a pot there at the end. He says, and things like this. <laughs> yeah. And things like these, which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, I warned you, I'm warning you again, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, this is a list of a byproduct of living in the flesh. They result in separation from God. In church, they have no place in the lives of those who call themselves followers of Jesus. They don't. They have no place in our lives. They're rotten fruit. They're bad fruit. So what's the product then of the Spirit? If kind produces fruit after its own kind, that's the flesh fruit. What's the Spirit fruit? The fruit of the Spirit is love. See, we could stop there, right? Because the fruit of the Spirit, if it is love, then everything else comes under that umbrella. Just as love is the one word fulfillment of the law, and being led by the Spirit frees us from the restrictions of the law, so love is the one word exemplification or demonstration of spirit fruit. How do you know if somebody's walking in the Spirit? How do you know if they're filled with the Spirit? How do you know if they're producing spirit fruit? Love, agape. Because everything else underneath that agape points back to the agape. Joy, love. Peace is love. Patience shows love. Kindness shows love. Goodness demonstrates love. Faithfulness is love. Self-control is love. If you want to do something for some personal growth or some personal study this week, take this list of the, of the fruit of the Spirit here in Galatians 5 and go to 1 Corinthians 13, the, the love chapter, and, and compare those things. Because 1 Corinthians, begins, uh, 1 Corinthians 13 begins how? Love is patient. Love is kind. You see, that's what flows out of that agape is those other character traits that point back to and exhibit, show the character and the nature of God himself. <laughs> now, those who belong to Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Ooh. So, what do we do? We love our neighbors ourselves, And then the other side of that coin, what do we do? We crucify, we put to death the passions of the flesh. Because we don't want those passions of the flesh to produce fruit in our lives. It's like, not only do you fertilize your garden plants, you pull the weeds. 
or maybe hit them with a weed killer or till them under or put mulch over them so they don't see the light of day. You see, not only do you promote growth, but you do away with the weeds, that which would inhibit growth. Not only do we promote love by living by the Spirit, but we put to death the deeds and the passions, the desires of the flesh. If we live by the Spirit, if we live, move, have our being in the Spirit, if we're Spirit-controlled, let us also walk by the Spirit. Oh, I love that. What does it mean to walk by the Spirit? The, the, the picture here is of marching. You've seen those videos of people marching and everything's in step, right? That's the picture here. Marching, walking, living, step by step, in tandem, in time with, in sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. See, just because you walk in the Spirit, step by step, don't flaunt it, right? Because if you, oh, look at me, how Spirit-filled I am. I'm walking with the Spirit. You flaunt it, you lose it. Humility, oh, look how humble I am, right? <laughs> Which is, has always made me chuckle when you read that Moses, in the book that Moses wrote, that Moses was the most humble man to walk the face of the earth. So the question becomes then, how do we go about producing this fruit? Because you see, we've looked at the fruit that the flesh produces. We looked at the fruit that the spirit produces. We've said that kind produces after its own kind. We've noted the necessity to be fruit inspectors. But, but how do we go about producing fruit? Well, again, familiar passage, turn to John chapter 15. This is one of the most challenging, simple things of life in, in the Spirit. John 15, verse 4, abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. You can't produce fruit. You can't produce spirit fruit unless you abide in the vine. You cut a, a limb off a tree. You cut a, a branch off a plant. Guess what? It's not going to produce fruit. You got to stay connected. You got to abide. You got to be in the vine. I am the vine, Jesus says. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can't do much. Uh-uh. You can do nothing. Oh, you can do things. You can do things. They just won't benefit the kingdom. They won't be successful. Not in terms of the kingdom. And they won't be beneficial for eternity when we do them in our own strength. You could do nothing. So if I want to do something to produce fruit, what do I do? Abide. Abide. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up. Then they gather them up, cast them into the fire, and they're burned. That's a sobering picture. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Don't misuse that. Don't misapply it. My Father is glorified by this. How? What? That you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. Okay, I want to glorify the Father. So I want to bear much fruit. How do I do that? Abide. Just as the Father has loved me, 
I have also loved you. Abide in my agape. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be made full. Do you see the cause and effect there? You see, we can get so caught up in life, can't we? And, and I'm... And I'm don't take what I'm saying as, as to mean we, we shouldn't be doing things. We shouldn't be sitting back with our arms folded and say, well, I'm just going to produce fruit. No, we do have our part to play. But sometimes we overcomplicate it. And I pretty much had my message prepared yesterday afternoon. And then the Holy Spirit just sort of took things and turned them upside down and brought me back to this. And that's because I needed to hear this. Because sometimes we can really get things complicated. I can really get things complicated. And that's when it's necessary to go back in simplicity to the beginning and say, where did all this start and how did all this happen? Oh, yeah, it's about life in the Spirit. <laughs> it's, it's about walking step by step with the Lord in the Spirit. And then that joy, not happiness, happiness is circumstantial. Joy is a Jesus thing. It comes relationally. It goes beyond in spite of our circumstances. How do we get that joy? Well, that joy comes because he's in us. Jesus is joy and he's in us. So here's the questions. What does the fruit of my life reveal about the source of its production? You know, there's produce, and you can scan a QR code now, produce in the grocery store, track where it comes from. I think they even do that with, with some meats. You can, you can track the source, where it was born, where it was raised, how it got to where it is at now. We evaluate the source of that production. Is it flesh or is it spirit? See, when we abide in Him, the life of the Spirit flows through us, producing fruit. And can we remind ourselves again? It's not about doing. It's about abiding. Because when we abide in Him, He abides in us. Again, that's not to be misunderstood, that, that there are not things that we should take action on. But in terms of producing fruit, it comes as a byproduct of our relationship with Him. Him living in us and Him producing fruit through the Spirit that lives within us. So, here's what I'd like to send you home with. If my fruit-producing focus is single-mindedly on abiding in Jesus then the fruit that I produce bears a remarkable resemblance to him. His character, his fruit, his agape. How do we define abide? I think we probably all kind of know what that means. But really, what's, what's kind of a, a nuts and bolts practical definition of that? And here's where I've come to on that is. Abide means to live in parallel to Jesus. So, so when I abide in Him, I'm walking, I'm living parallel to Him. I'm walking step in step with the Spirit forwards, backwards, stopping. I'm speaking, being quiet. I'm sensitive to his voice and responding to it. Not perfectly. But with an awareness that he's my life. Now, 
what does the fruit of your life look like? See, that's, that's a hard question sometimes to, to want to answer because we don't always like that answer. If you don't know the answer to that question, ask somebody close to you that you can trust <laughs> to tell you the truth. Hopefully somebody that will be kind and yet care enough about you that they will say, look, this is the fruit I'm seeing of your life. Okay, so where can I improve? Do I need more love in my life? How can I grow in that? I'm just going to close with prayer for this part of today. And I want to give just an opportunity for you just in, in the silence of your own place there to respond. Because I, I don't know how the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, <clears throat> but I'm confident that He has because He's faithful to His Word. The worship team is going to come back up and then... Um, while they're up here, after my prayer, we'll distribute the, uh, the communion elements, and then I'll, I'll come back up uh, after this first song. We'll have communion together, and then we'll close out uh, with worship. So, Holy Spirit, thank you for your presence here. Thank you for challenging, convicting. Thank you for your provision of life. Thank you for reminding us of the need to abide and not to always be doing. Let me say, if you're, if you're present here, if you're under the sound of my voice, whether you're present in the room, you're listening online, or you're listening later, the first thing that I just really need you to hear is that none of this is going to make sense to you unless you have that relationship with Jesus. And if you don't have that relationship with Jesus, then you need it. Because you, you can't bear spirit fruit. You can't bear fruit that looks like and reflects the character and the nature of Jesus if His Spirit doesn't live within you. And so I want to, I want to say to you this morning, if, if you've not been born again, then let's do that today. You know, we're going to partake of communion here in a little bit. We celebrate that as, a, as an open communion. It means you don't, you don't have to be at a certain place within this congregation. You don't have to be a, a church member, so to speak, because we believe that the Scripture teaches, and it's pretty clear, actually, that if you're born again, if you're saved, then you are a member of the church. You're a member of the body of Christ. And so if, you, if you're a member of the body of Christ, His church, then we invite you to partake with us today. And if you're not a member, then we'd like to have you be a member. Because when you are born again, the Holy Spirit regenerates, renews, restores. There's a metamorphosis that goes on. That's why it's called the new birth, being born again. We become led by the Spirit and not the flesh. So if that's you, then let me pray with you. Jesus, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I'm accepting your view of my life. And I recognize that I can't be saved any other way except through you. I believe your words when you said that you are the only way to the Father. You're the only means to salvation. 
So I accept your view of you, and I ask you now to forgive me of my sin. I ask the Holy Spirit to come and live within me. And I repent. And I want to do things your way now and not my own. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, from this day on to help me live for you, to walk with you step by step in parallel, in tandem with. And if you prayed that prayer with me, then please get in touch with us. Um, if you're here in the room today, um, talk to myself. Talk to one of these on the worship team. Um, find Pastor Rob. Find someone here that you know knows Jesus. And let them pray with you. Let us pray with you. And if you're out there you're listening online, or maybe you're listening later for, for some reason, um, get in touch with the church here. Let them know. Have them help you grow and mature. And I pray for each one of us You know, our, our, just the, the way that we can make things so complicated sometimes, Lord. But today I pray for just a, a fresh breath of the Spirit. And as we conclude now with worship and communion, May the words of the song ring true.